as you leave the nave, you enter through this wonderful gothic archway down this corridor. And the first thing you notice are the backlit stained glass windows, each with their own narrative. But above them and around them, you can see these wonderful gargoyles and grotesque masks and clusters of foliate work, all hand carved by the stonemasons, punctuating the architecture. But there's a bigger surprise waiting for us just around the corner. And this is it, the Octagon, known because it has eight sides to this room. It was built in 1288. And as you can see, the ceiling soars high to the heavens and the light comes flooding in. It's known as the Chapter House and it's a meeting room. But if you get over that and you look at the detail on the wall, in the stone itself, you can see the work of a master stonemaker. He's made stone come alive. My face in the foliage, you've seen that face before. If you look closely, you can see faces peering down at you from between the foliage. This image of a mysterious, at times frightening man in the trees is what came to be known as the Green Man. Well, I've counted 15 of them. Now, the question is, who was the Green Man and what's he doing here? And why are there so many of them? This ancient image is thought to have its roots in pagan beliefs, dating as far back as 3000 BC. But it's Dr Colin Harris who has had a lifelong obsession with the Green Man who can shed more light on him. So who was the Green Man? Simply a concept which was absorbed by the early church about the spirit of nature, about the spirit of birth, life, death and rebirth, which people felt a great oneness with, particularly when you consider that England was covered largely in forest. Mm. From Bath to Nottingham, a squirrel would never have to jump on the ground. In most religions and in most continents for many thousands of years, the green man, as we now call him, has been an integral part of our oneness with the Mother Earth. So, so the green man is venerated all over the world? Absolutely. The Green Man was a revered spirit, worshipped as a symbol of renewal, rebirth and regeneration, but he also found his way into more common beliefs. There are also this link, this, this secular link, with our folklore, our customs, our traditions, that the Green Man popped up as parts of festivals. Through Anglo-Saxon times and to the present day, the Green Man appeared in old stories, customs and characters like Jack in the Green and Jack the Lad. Even the myth of Robin Hood may have emerged out of beliefs in a gift-giving Green Man. It's quite an interesting story that the Green Man, this kind, benevolent, overarching concept in our lives, became a very important person like Robin Hood. It was only in the 1930s that the phrase of green man came into use when someone recognised the similarity between folkloric traditions and the carvings found in churches. But I wanted to know how had this pagan image made its way into churches like Southall in the forms of these medieval green man carvings? And the church brought the green man in with its own symbolism and its sort of, you know, little effigies and carvings, yep. really, in order to get more worshippers in, to get the pagans into church, well, do you think? Uh, not so much so bums on seats, but much more about not offending previous faiths. In other words, church leaders in places like Southall saw the need to incorporate the Green Man into the church as a way of embracing the long-held beliefs of their community. With that in mind, it's time to get back into the chapter house to get a better look at this man for all seasons. As well as the green man, there is a green woman. This is extremely rare and valuable and she's over there. There are other faces as well that you can spot. One above the door, now that's the Jewish usurer. He was the moneylender who probably financed the chapter house. These images are out of kilter with the taste of the time, which was for rigid form. Here there is a freedom and a fluidity, surely the reason why people flock here from all over the world. 
The detail in the carving is not only exquisite, but it's absolutely astonishing. Just look at this plant life. Look at the leaves here. No two leaves are the same. They're all horticulturally correct, and there's 14 different varieties of plant life. There's field maple there, and there's oak leaf there. Not only was he a great draftsman, but he must have studied plant life. It's the freedom of his hand, I find, so astonishing. Now, this one is my favourite one. Not for subject matter, I hasten to add, but for technical merit. What you have to remember here is the mason has carved this, all of these things, out of one solid lump of stone. Look at the undercuts. Look how he's got inside that to sort of work back outwards. You can see the light and shade created by these voids. Now, first of all, you notice the leaf work. You can see that's ivy there, look, with berries sort of clinging on. But if you look underneath that, you can see an observation on real life. Two hounds ripping a hair apart. I mean, it is a masterpiece, a technical masterpiece. The man behind this extraordinary stonework is right here in the chapter house itself. Now that is a self-portrait of the master mason who did all of this wonderful work, bringing this building alive. I am in awe of this chap. We don't know his name. He probably was an itinerant worker who came over from France. His work is absolutely dynamic, and as far as I'm concerned, completely unparalleled. So, a pagan belief, a folkloric tradition, and a symbol of renewal, and giving back to the people. But can we ever really know exactly who the Green Man was? He's a conundrum. Yeah. He's a puzzle which has no answer. And I've never come up with a, a true black and white single answer as to what he is. I'm the Green Man, don't take my We may never man. know who he is, but we are left with these wonderful carvings which conjure up another time and place. And for that, we have the Mason of Southerminster to thank. You cut me down, I spring back green again. <laughs>